Mark Curry. Yes. Legendary Bay Area comedy figure. Yes, yes. Welcome to Vlad TV. Truly an honor. It's truly an honor to be here. Been watching you for about a decade. We used to sell your tapes bootleg in <laughs> Oakland. So <laughs> the unique interviews you used to do with the rappers because you were the only one who would do, you know, deep rappers. Yeah, I tried. From short, 40, to, we saw all that. So yeah. much respect. Thank you, man. Thank yeah. you. You well, got a ghetto pass. We ain't going to steal your stuff when we see you. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank mm -hmm. you. I appreciate the cosign. Much respect. Well, it's your first time here. So <laughs> let's go ahead and start in the beginning. All right. You're from Oakland. Yes, Oakland, California. What part of Oakland? East Side Oakland. East Side Oakland. 73rd. 73rd. They're representing 700. We in this place. 73rd. They never thought we would do anything. Okay. So you grew up in Oakland, 70s. 80s. Mm -hmm. 70s were, were cool. And then 80s, cool. things started to kind of go a bit haywire. Right, right. Well, if you look at the timeline, really, I started in the 60s. The 60s. If we never look at the timeline. 60s, I was born a slave. Because when I was born, 19, they, think about it, they didn't have, a, they didn't have um, voting. My parents couldn't vote. When I was born, your parents couldn't vote when you were born. Yeah, they didn't have it, it, the uh, the Civil Rights Act wasn't passed. Mm -hmm. So when I was born, I was just a nobody. Mm -hmm. So we had the '60s, like you said, and, a, and I saw the '60s were a very important part of me because I, mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of when I was a little kid growing up. Right. Then you get into the '70s. Yes. In the '70s, you were a kid. Mm -hmm. You know, seven, eight, nine years old, early teens. What were the '70s like in Oakland? 70s like in Oakland was incredible because you had an influence of so many characters, so many different ideologies, so many things. You had the Black Panthers who were influential in my life because they were the first people who gave me food. Uh, they gave me food, the free programs. I remember giving food. Somebody, when you, I, we weren't poor, but somebody giving you a bag of food, thank you very much. I remember that, those sugar pops from the, and those little foods. It was just, it wasn't that we were poor, but it was a great gift. Mm -hmm. We had the black Muslims. They would come knock on the door and say, right. you white fish, my, my, my brother, my brother, you got to stop eating that pork, my brother. So we had the black Muslims over here. My brother, you got to stop listening to the white man. Then you had the black Muslim, my brother, you got to stop eating pork. And then, you know, I was Catholic and I, I was an altar boy. So I was in conflict. You know, I've been going to Catholic. I was an altar boy you know, every day going through conflict. Then we had winos. That's B.C. before crack. Ooh. We had winos. Winos were different. They were wine. Yeah, they were slower. <laughs> and they talk. Hey, they, and, and they knew you. They, hey, Mark, slow down, boy. You know, or whatever. You know, hey, Mark. You know, hey, you know what? You know, whatever. So, and we had not only that, we had ads going against us. Every ad was cool cigarettes, was malt liquor. And be, when I went to school, I remember I had to pass one, two like four liquor stores just to get to school. So that's what the 70s was like. Okay. And, and I got to <laughs> say, I mean, you mentioned the the, the black Muslims. Uh, mm -hmm. My favorite fish sandwich in the world was the the black Muslim bakery. bakery. Yes. The uh, white fish. The, the white fish, man. Woo! I still dream about that. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about. I know what I'm talking about. What? Yesin, Yesin Bay? Yeah, Yusin Bay. Yusin Bay. Yeah. Right. Had yes. a whole bunch of them, and it was literally the best fish sandwich exactly. ever. You that's know what I'm talking over. about. You know, that's, and, and it was healthy, my brother. <laughs> it was healthy on it top was, of it that. Was, it wasn't cooked in those saturated oils that you use. Right. This is white fish, my brother. Yep. Yes. So then we get into the 80s. Wow. And then we get into the crack era. Yeah. Now, did you know uh, Felix Mitchell personally? You know, the first time that I ever got into a limousine, Felix Mitchell let me sit in his limousine. Mm. I was at Dock of the Bay. I was um, a young comic, and I think I just won a competition or something like that. And, and Felix Mitchell was sitting in the limousine. I, ain't, I had never been in the limousine. Never, you know, I, I was in a, at that time, I had a 67 Volkswagen. Mm. And he said, man, you want to sit in there? I said, yeah, yeah, man, I just sit in here and just and sit in there. So, you know, Felix Mitchell. I mean, Felix Mitchell was 69th Village and we were 73rd, so. It's right there. Yeah, right there. Okay. What happened when crack first hit Oakland? When crack first hit Oakland, it was like a, a movie. It was like an epidemic because you would see selective people suddenly that you knew that were straight suddenly 
getting weirder and weirder and stranger and stranger. And so you saw the effect of, of crack hit. You didn't know what it was. It was like suddenly these normal people suddenly own one. Hey, sir! And you, can, you knew. It was nothing you can really do in the hood. It was just like, you know, oh, it got them, it got them. And you never know who it would get. Mm -hmm. And then not only that, that's when I, I started comedy in, the, in 87. So here you, you know, before I even did comedy, the crack epidemic was in, so incredible that it was hitting our ways, but then it was making dudes rich. Mm -hmm. So here you, the underlying, you see people just walk, you know, regular people that you know on crack, and then you see, you know, dudes getting money. Then not the bad thing, the death rate. So many people got killed. Mm -hmm. It was just incredible. Right, because it brought the violence. Brought the violence. And then the money brought, you know, a higher level of weaponry. Yeah. People started using the AK Uzi. 47s the and that Uzi. The Uzi and... changed the game. Uzi yeah. changed. That's why you don't see no more karate schools in Oakland. Right. <laughs> Uzi changed the game. <laughs> <laughs> you not know, chop, chop an Uzi. Yeah. Yeah, man. And then, like you said, the millionaires. Yeah. You know, Felix Mitchell was the biggest figure. Yeah. And you look at it in the black community, you know, I know people will scoff at this, but he was. A, 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 a idol. He was somebody to look up to. Who was there? I mean, I think I did pretty well in my life as far as idols, you know, people that well, you know, but I looked up at Felix Mitchell. He had cars. He had, who else was there? Ain't no, no sports figure was there. You know, I mean, my father was a working man, but I didn't have no, who was I to look at in that hood? You know, and that's true. And I made it pretty well, but he, he was somebody we looked at. He had the cars. He had everything. Oh, yeah. I mean, when he died, he had a procession of like 20 Rolls Royce yeah. limousines I and I horses. There. Oh, you were there. You saw the funeral. There. Of course. I was there. How crazy was it? That was It was incredible. It was something we had never seen. We had never seen Rolls Royce. We had never seen a carriage. We had never seen, you know, it was just an amazing situation. I'm not glorifying it, but it was just something. Of course we went. We were from that hood. Mm -hmm. We had to go look. Like, did you yourself get mixed up into the drug game at all, or you Never, stayed clear? You know, the Lord blessed me and gave me the path, and uh, I didn't, I didn't have to do it. You know, great. I didn't have to do it, which is, you know, yeah. which is great. You might yeah. not be here right now. I might not be here right now. Yeah, definitely, definitely, definitely. You know, but I'd have been good at it. <laughs> I'd have been good at it. What? Yeah, of course. When you're good, good at it, they tried to kill my wife. I would have done some uh, Denzel. Well, maybe you have enemies, right? I mean, you're successful. What, you're successful with a success took a shot at you? What, you'd rather be unsuccessful and have no friends? <laughs> well, then, with Felix Mitchell passing, Lil D took over. Did you know Lil D back then? Lil D, yeah, of course. Daryl Reed. He was a, he was a legend. Mm -hmm. He was an Oakland legend. Yep. He, he was an Oakland legend. Yeah, we know Lil D. What? BMWs, he had 320, he had BMW when we was on AC Transit. Right. He would give parties at the turf, the turf center, turf party, it was incredible. Incredible, you had never seen nothing like that. It was opulent, it was incredible. Yeah, he did, he was incredible. Well, we knew Lil D, he was real cool, you know? I was a comedian, I was a buddy comedian, and a nod from him was like, yeah, you know? And I said to him, Lord, did you remember me back then? He said, yeah! He said, you know, Lil D, I remember, I was in, he was he was a hood celebrity. Yep, he was a hood celebrity. He was a he was the one you wanted to get. You know that who else? He was he, he was big. He was he was big. Yeah, yeah. I just interviewed him. At one point, you were known as the crack king of Oakland. Uh yes. Uh huh. Now at that at that age, 18, 19, 20 years old, when when you know you were doing this, did you have? Did you ever sit back and say, man, I, I'm making millions of dollars, but I can't ignore the fact that I'm destroying these communities. You know, you have these mothers and grandmothers and children and these crack babies and, you know, these neighborhoods when I was a kid, you know, when you were a kid were nice neighborhoods, suddenly were just war torn, yeah. you know, and along with the crack, you know, even though your personal operation may not have been violent, but crack brought an incredible amount of violence. You know, for example, you know, when I interviewed Big U, you know, who's affiliated with the Rolling 60s, yeah, he said the one thing that, uh -huh. you know, 
he, he said the one thing that he they he noticed that when he got out of prison and saw crack hit LA that the weapons started to change. The murder rates are happening along with the, the drug addiction and the communities being destroyed. You know, you you saw all this. So did you start to think about it, any of that in, during that time? I, I, I didn't, I wasn't thinking about that at the time because again, when, when you young and you getting money, you chasing the money. You, you know, you, uh, you, you're not thinking about those things though. You oblivious to those things though, because in your head, you feel like, man, all I'm doing is doing what I got to do to try to try to get out, get out the neighborhood, you know. But at the same time, like I told you, you, you still damaging the neighborhood. And then when he got caught up, he didn't tell on anybody. He took a 35 year sentence. 35 kingpin, yeah. Excuse me. He took the kingpin, yeah. The the, the kingpin law, right? Yep. 35 to life. Yep. Something like that. You know, no possibility of parole. Remember that. When he got popped, I was working at Pay and Save Drugstore. And I'll never forget the day, you know, I was working at Pay and Save in Berkeley. And, um, and somebody gave me a paper. And I looked at the paper and it said, Little D got arrested. And I, da, da, da. I remember that day. And that, that's how big that, that was. I remember that day, you know. Thank you. The Oakland water. Brought Oakland. to you from Lake Merritt. <laughs> Lake Merritt water. Lake Merritt water. <laughs> Lake Merritt water. That's right. <laughs> Don't drink Fuji water. Don't drink all that other. Drink Oakland water. Mm. Yee, 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 yee. <clears throat> Oakland water. <laughs> yee, yee. Make you say yee, yee. So Lil D gets locked up. Ends up doing twenty eight years. Was Lil D pretty much the end of the of the Oakland drug kingpin? I don't know. I don't know. Well, I just and didn't hear any big names. This hypocrisy. This is hypocrisy of. You know, of America, I don't know. I mean, I think that, you know, when Lil D left, Starbucks took over. But they came in. Yeah. Suddenly they rehabilitating the neighborhood. Suddenly you seeing Starbucks popping up. I think the dope trade went liquid. Think about that. You go to Starbucks, they stand in line like they dope fiends. <laughs> ah! Ah! <laughs> Try to cut one of them lines at Starbucks. You get slept. Hey! I'm dead serious. That's, the dope trade went into Starbucks. You don't know what's in that package. They don't hand. They push it to you. They don't right. hand it to you. Thank you. You'll be back, and you and you are back. And you will be back. Think about that. Yep. Well, actually, matter of fact, I heard the CEO of Starbucks say, "I want everyone in America to have three main places they go to: their home, their work, and Starbucks." Wow. Think about that. Yeah. Well, sir, serve some healthier food. Come on, now they ain't got no kitchen in. How are you gonna make bacon sandwiches with no <laughs> kitchen? That's why. Hey, who, who made the bacon sandwich? You got a little hot plate back there. Thank you. They give you so much sodium and so much sugar. You on one? They dope things. Okay, so <laughs> you're growing up in, in Oakland, and I guess Oakland, you went to yeah, that's uh, right. Uh, you went to St. Joseph's High School. St. Joe's in Alameda. Yep. Boom boom. You were six six in high school. Six six. Six six, and uh, you started playing basketball, mm -hmm. but then you got cut in the tenth grade. I got cut by a punk ass coach, Mister Phelps. You heard that from me? You're a punk ass. Look at me now, and I never liked him. He never liked me. I never told a story. He just—he was a—he was—he just, you know, he never liked me, and I never, you know, it was a trip. So he cut me in the tenth grade, but it was the best thing that ever happened to me because I found academics. And so okay. thank you, Mr. Phelps, for cutting me in the 10th grade, you punk ass. But I found academics because I was so, I was going to, I was going to transfer to Fremont. I remember I, you know, Glenn Carraway and Vic Hampton, you know, I, I'm, I, I swear, I, I went, I remember I went up to Fremont and looked at it, looked around, I was different from St. Joe's, but I was going to come here. I said, fuck. Then I, but then my, my beautiful English teacher, uh, you know, and then, uh, and, and then I just got into academics. I said, well, Boom, and I saw that I could do it, and that, that was great. Why would a coach cut someone who's six six in the tenth grade in high school? That doesn't make any sense well, he didn't on like any my, level. You know what? Let's let's get this out. This six six tough. in the tenth grade, like six six is rare as hell. You know period. what? He didn't but like my brother, grade? and he didn't like me. Okay. First day of school. This is the first day of school at St. Joseph's. First day, little ghetto boy dressed. Mama got me dressed right. 
first day of school, first day, homeroom. You had to say, first day, he said, da, 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 da. Curry, you, your brother Gary, be, uh, be on your P's and Q's here, uh, something like that. Hmm. I, the first day, I'm like, what the fuck? First day in homeroom. All right, you're a Curry, watch yourself. I'm like, this dude. Then I remember he locked me in the, it was a basketball game. First of all, everybody paid their little $20 to get Adidas, I think, high top Adidas, pro models. Or, or Nikes or something, but he bought me Adidas. So everybody on the team had Nikes and I was the only one with Adidas. I'm like, motherfucker. And then he locks me in, he locks the door. This is true. I never told nobody, he locks the door. You know, when it, my shoes came late, of course, he kept them. And then he locked the door when I was in there trying them on. And so I couldn't get out. I remember that, I was like, this dude, so you was a punk ass bitch, Mr. Phelps. You know, that's never been told, but you, you know, but I did pretty well. Do you think in retrospect, let's just say you had a coach that said, hey, this could be the next big basketball star. I'm really gonna put a lot of extra focus on him, a lot of extra training. Do you think that you had the athletic ability to keep no, going no, with it? No, no, Or I you mean, were just really tall? I was a good ball player, you know, yeah. but you know, those, some guys had better abilities than me, of okay. course. You know, I, I wasn't a professional. I wasn't nothing like that. But you know, I, you know, I did Okay. My so, ambitions, you know, I saw guys that were 100% better than me. So I had no, you know, ambitions, but, but you know, still, that was memorable. Right, because a lot of a lot of big ball players came out of came yeah, out of Oakland. Yeah. A lot, Phil Barner. We had Lester Connors. We had J.R. Ryder. You know, Gary Payton. Gary Payton was that around your time? G.P. No, um, no, Gary was younger than me. Younger, yeah. I saw you know I saw Gary come on you know, Castle Mount. He was Castle the first. Mount. He was he was the first first you know player to enter in. The, in the enter the NBA draft with a Lord Jesus perm. With a perm. And that's a, in the history books. <laughs> the he history had a straight book. perm, Lord Jesus, straight down. Castle Mount. So you graduate high school mm -hmm. and you go to college. Yeah. Uh, I got California State University. I don't know what you Yeah, Cal State about. Hayward. Cal State Hayward. I got, I got into Cal State Hayward. Cal State Hayward. Doing the damn bus strike. I didn't have a car. Okay. Oh my God. I had to get on the bus to go to Cal State Hayward. And at that point, while going to college, that's when comedy started to come around. Well, you know, it, it, it was, I was, comedy wasn't a viable art. You know, you didn't say I'm gonna be the comedian, they didn't have comedians then. Well, you had Richard Pryor. Yeah, but it was, that was just like, you know, you had Bill Frank Cosby. Sinatra. Yeah, these are older dudes that you didn't aspire yeah. to be. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't a, like it was now. Who, who was the young, hot comedian during that time? Because Eddie Murphy came a little Isn't later. That, was funny. Sinbad, Sinbad was, was the rough. name. Yeah, Sinbad was the name. Um, as far as it was before Eddie Murphy, really just yeah. a bunch of, you know, Jimmy J.J. Walker was a big comedian at the mm -hmm. time. Um, you know, so. Okay. But it wasn't a viable, like, okay, no. I can't, I gotta get a real job. Right. I'm right. going to school to learn a trade, to graduate and get a job right. and be a working man like my father. Right, right. That was my thing. But then comedy started happening. Yeah, comedy, well, it, it happened like this. I was in Cal State Hayward doing well, mm -hmm. I, you know, and then my father kicked me out the house. <laughs> so I, <laughs> that that derailed the college thing because I had to go to work. So uh, while I was working, bam, you know, a guy, Travis Curry, who worked at Pay and Save in San Francisco one night and I was the manager and he was crazy. He said, man, I'm gonna go try comedy. I'm gonna <laughs> try comedy. I'm gonna, say, I'm gonna do it too, I'm gonna go with you. Mm. And Travis Curry, and um, so we went to the Lucky Lion in Oakland, over near the airport. It was a gong show that was on Soul Beat. Okay. And so Sh shout out to Linnell. Yeah, shout out to Linnell eating ice. She was the first person to eat ice on air, and she's in the Black Hall of Fame. <laughs> <laughs> we love you, Linnell. Um, I have still have the Linnell in a two piece poster in my bedroom. She's, in a two piece. Arching, yeah, in a two piece, <laughs> and she's arching it. She's, I love she's a regular on the show, actually. Yeah, she I comes by her. all the time. You get her poster. The poster's rare and it's signed. She's arching it. <laughs> okay. It's, it's on the 98.5. I love that poster. Um, so yeah. the gong, they had a gong show. Okay. They had a gong show. Bam. I went up. 
And I said, uh, my joke was Michael Jackson and Janet Jackson, the same people, because you never seen them at the same place at the same time. Gone. <laughs> but why I got gone, I felt good on the mic. So I said something. I'm like, dang, man, I didn't even get a chance to do this in this little raggedy piece of place or something. Da, 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 da. It looked like a funeral home. And people laughed. And so my little comment, boom, 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 boom. I like, wow. Mm. I, and I touched that golden mic and from then from the Lucky Lion, where they used to film porno shows, went from I went from there. Okay. So you started doing stand-ups like on a regular basis, like open mics? Yeah, so I doing like open that. mics, I doing everything I can. Every time I got on the mic, you know, bam, bam, just around Oakland. You know, I just I did everything. I okay. did barbecues, I did I did dope dealer spots, I did I did everything. Mm. I did everything. Barbecues. I did uh my God. And yeah, I did everything. Then we had a hot spot, the Hyatt. The Hyatt uh in Oakland, California. And that was a that was a hot spot of comedy at that time. In the eighties. Do you remember like your worst bomb or your worst heckling during that time? No, because I was a professional. Because I didn't I didn't get heckled. That didn't okay. happen. Because I was ready and I heckled you first. Mm. So they didn't get a chance to help. Ain't nobody help with Mark Curry. Okay, that's what's up. No, that don't happen. You can help with me now. <laughs> I destroy you. I wish that you didn't never say shit. I wish a motherfucker would. Yeah, I wish a motherfucker would. I came out, and that was during the 80s when the dope dealers used to give me money to talk about their friends. I used to say, damn, talk about you up here. I brrr, light into them. Yeah. So I guess after two years of doing comedy, you were you could finally quit your job at that point. 87, yeah, I quit my job and, well, I started in 87, 88, yeah, maybe about two years, yeah. Okay. Yeah. How did that feel to finally say, okay, I could actually do this for a living? Well, I remember the day that happened. I remember I quit my job, I was in the front, and I had wanted, I had just won, here I would, I would go superstar to working at Pay and Save. I just came in second in the rig San Francisco comedy competition, you know, and, here I was back at work the next day. Mm -hmm. And so they had offered me, you know, all these club owners were like, hey, we offer you $1,500 for all this work. All this work was just coming in. And so um, I knew I had to quit, to, you know, to do what I need to do. And I remember I was, I was, I said, I gotta go talk to my boss. I gotta go tell him I'm gonna quit. His name was Rick from Pay and Save. Thank you, Rick, he was real cool. And I went to Rick, I said, Rick, I got, man, I think I might have to quit, Rick. He said, man, I understand, Mark. Just do what you think. And he was real cool. I thought he was going to say, damn. I was like, thank you, Rick. Easier than I thought. And I remember that day. Because that's the day where I let go of my financial freedom. Because I was always a comedian who had always looked good. Because these motherfuckers look broke and raggedy. I'm a comedian. Fuck that. I always had outfits. I always was clean. You know, stepped with an, I had a car. You know, I was like, I ain't know no broke. We don't do no broke and, you know, raggedy. And so I let go of that. And bam, I moved to Los Angeles. So I guess your first like big break came, uh, uh, I guess opening up for Damon Wayans. No, first break was Showtime at the Apollo. Aha. Okay. That's now, now that's a rough crowd. Yeah, and I and I got through it. I walked out there in the middle of winter. Never been to New York. My brother gave me a white linen suit. I had walked out with a white linen suit in the middle of New York and some tan <laughs> shoes. I was six seven, six eight. I walked out. And I heard the crowd talking, look at that suit, my buddy. Where you get that suit? Where you get that bed? Hey! <laughs> I just kept walking and I hit him, boom, boom, boom. And I killed him. And I was the last comedian. Everybody got booed. I was sitting in there. I didn't know nobody, just sitting there by myself. And the lady came in, no matter what happens, keep going. If you get booed, then we can um, edit it, okay? Everything, it was like 15 dudes got booed. Boo! It was like I felt I was in, you know, the 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 um, the eighteen hundred the the lion. What do you call it? The uh, Coliseum. Yeah, the Coliseum. Next, boo! I'm like, damn, boo! And I went up last dude and killed it, and the rest is history. And I remember the suit I had on. Oh, okay. And I and I got home, and they said it was gonna air it weeks later, and they aired it that night or something. And so when I went back to Oakland, I remember I went to Quarter Pound. It was the first time I ever signed an autograph. I went to Quarter Pound, you know, late night. Dude said, oh, man, we just saw you on TV. I was like, what? Damn. Yeah, I, it was, I was famous. 
You're in a Volkswagen, a quarter pound or 80 knife, and the dude noticed me, and the people noticed me, and I was famous from that point on. Thank you. Sign my first autograph at quarter pound. <laughs> That's right. Okay. So then the Damon Wayans thing came later? Well, Damon Wayans took me on tour with him, mm -hmm. and then HBO saw me. So, and Damon Wayne said, they're going to give you a special. I said, man, they ain't going to give me no goddamn special. He said, watch. I said, they ain't going to give me no special. You crazy, dude. It just didn't, it didn't even make sense. Because I didn't even, um, I was still living in Oakland. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and I moved to, um, and they gave me a special. And they offered me a special. I was like, what? Offered me an HBO special? What? It just blew my mind. So things started to really go up from there. Yeah. And I guess you, uh. You opened up for Whitney Houston. For I'm the, on tour with Whitney Houston. You're on tour with Whitney Houston. Respect my name. People put respect on my name. All right? Let me tell you the things I've done. Put some respect on my motherfucking name. On tour with Whitney Houston. Mm -hmm. Bam. Can you say that? No. Opened up for Richard Pryor. Mm. Can you say that? No. Opened up for Ray Charles mm. at the Richmond Auditorium in 1989. I think 87. Mm. Ray Charles, baby. Uh, bam, just wanted to put a little respect on my name. Any crazy uh, Whitney stories? No. No. Nope. Beautiful. Beautiful. Crazy thing about Whitney Houston, I'm performing at, and I don't know how many people, I, I think it was Floyd, I don't know, I don't know, a million people. I don't know, I don't know how big this thing was. It was huge. And I'm performing, and Whitney Houston, you hear, go, Mark, go, Mark. And I look, and Whitney Houston will come and watch my show. Before her show. I remember I looked at the stage with Whitney Houston. I was like, oh. And bam, and she was the coolest lady ever. I went to her wedding. I was really? Wedding. Yeah. When she married Bobby? Yeah. That was it. Ah. That was it. That's right. But rest in peace, Whitney, man. Such a, such a she loss. Was the best. I remember greatest Whitney story. We were performing, big giant, you know, Coliseum, and she would do, you know, um, you know, prep, you know, she would come and sing before the show, you know, test the mic. I remember I walked all the way to the back of the Coliseum. I said, damn, I got to perform in this. So I was doing Coliseums before I was doing clubs. Okay, people, remember that. Remember that. And boom. And Whitney Houston would just, ah! and it would fill the whole Coliseum. It was, just a, it was crazy. I would be way at the back, and you could hear her. It was just incredible. Yeah, I mean, Whitney had one of the greatest, you know, female voices. Incredible. Of the last hundred years. Yeah. Definitely you, top three. When she, like when she did the Super Bowl, I was there. Thank you. Hello. There we go. Okay. Also, just let me just put some respect on my name, Oakland Coliseum. Before I could even get into the punchline, they wouldn't even let me perform. I was doing the Oakland Coliseum with the Fresh Festival. Mm. Think about that. I remember that. Yep. Yes. I was a comedian. For the Fresh Fest. Yes. The Fresh Fest with uh what's the uh Houdini, Run DMC. Yeah, Houdini. Run DMC, um, I remember NWA was a little group, Ice T, LL Cool J, LL Cool J came out, cleared everybody out, uh, Eric B and Rakim, thank you, just wanted to let you know, put some respect on my name. Okay, so, so then <laughs> in 91, you were in uh, Talking Dirty After Dark yeah. with Martin Lawrence. Yeah. That was your first film? Yeah. Yep, first, first Martin film. Lawrence was a monster back then. He was a monster. Always has been a monster. Still is a monster. Still is a monster. Still is a monster. I'm working on Bad Boys 2. Yeah, he's still a monster. Or Bad Boys 3. Huh? Yeah. Which one is it? <laughs> Bad Boys, is it 3? Is it 3 now? I don't know. He's a monster. Always a monster. Always okay. has been. Since day one. So, you're doing these shows. Me and Martin did our HBO specials together. Aha. You got your HBO specials, mm -hmm. but then the TV show comes around. Yeah. I was offered. I was doing... Showtime at the Apollo. They offered me a sitcom, and I was also offered in Living Color. People really? don't know that. Put some respect on my name. Why, why did you turn down in Living Color? Well, it was either Mr. Cooper or in Living Color. Oh, yeah. And I gave Steve Harvey the Apollo. Mm. I gave it to him. Put some respect on my name, Steve. I, I, I gave it to him. Okay. Then he ended up stealing my material. Damn. For real? Look it up. What did he steal? Yeah, Bob. Yeah, this is Bob TV. Look it up. <laughs> well, on this TV show, he did a whole thing on Halloween. Mm -hmm. And that was all my bits. 
And so he did his whole thing on Halloween. Look it up. I want you people to look it up. On this TV show, look, he talking about Halloween. Uh, my mama put boxes on us. Dude, that was my material. Come on, man. And he used all my material. And I confronted him. He like he didn't know. But maybe he didn't. Maybe, maybe some writers gave it to him, you know. Maybe. Maybe. But still, that's my livelihood. You know, you taking money, you know, I wrote that because it really happened. Put some respect on my name. <laughs> you know. Okay. Well, I can see why you would turn down being a cast member on A Living Color to having yeah. your own show yeah. on Hang with Mr. Cooper. Yeah. Yeah. It was a Living Color. Because I used to do warm up for In Living Color. Damon, mm. I was on tour with Damon. He would let me do, even after my HBO special, I was still doing warm up for In Living Color. Mm. Because I think it was a job. And, you know, people, it wasn't beneath me. I had an HBO special. I was still. Right. And Living Color was one of the hottest shows oh back then. Oh, my God. I it used was, to watch him film yeah. it till two in the morning, three in the morning. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. I mean, you're talking about Jim Carrey. That was how he got started. Jim Carrey, Damon. <laughs> Damon Wayne. I mean, all the Kenan, Wayne's family. Yeah. Right now. Yeah, all of them. Yeah, man. Uh, even uh, Jennifer Lopez was a backup yeah, dancer. Jennifer, she, was a, yeah. <laughs> she, she was one of the. You, she was the one you didn't even look at. She wasn't the finest <laughs> one. You didn't even look at <laughs> Exactly. And she became Jennifer Lopez. So then you got the show Hanging with Mr. Cooper. Bum, bum, bum. Which, uh, ended up running for five seasons? Yep. Five and, uh, seasons. 100 episodes. 100 episodes. Well, what network was it on? ABC. ABC. Yep. So you were on one of the big networks with a major show. Yep. How, how did that feel to really star in a sitcom like that? It felt incredible. It felt very incredible. It was, um, it was, it was the most, you know, iconic thing ever. It's, it's beyond, you know, it was beyond a dream. And as he was a dream, it, you know, it was like, wow. But I was trying to be intelligent as possible, Mr. Cooper. You know, that's why I, instead of the basketball, you know, I was, you know, I would have a laptop and, you know, we try to, I wanted to be a little educated. I didn't want to be a buffoon, you know. So, I, you know, and Mr. Cooper was awesome. It was made me an international star. International, right? Because it got syndicated all over the yeah. world. I walk in, if I walk to Australia, people knew me. When I went to Australia, went to Germany, Pro Sieben, I went to Spain, I went to Africa. You know, I'm in Africa, in Tanzania. No, I was in um, yeah, Tanzania, and I'm taking a leak outside the car, and I just heard somebody say, "Mr. Kuba, Mr. Kuba." <laughs> I looked on the hill. I said, "I saw. How you got know? You everybody knew you. Come on, <laughs> What are you saying? You can tell your dog. We know who you are. Whoa. Oh, the African accent. Love yeah, it. Yeah. You nailed it. Yeah. <laughs> and I was the first one to perform in Africa, people, after Richard Pryor. Really? Yeah. Aha. Yeah. That's what's up. Yeah. Okay. And Raven Simone is on the show. Yes. This is after the Cosby show. Yes. Which was the biggest thing ever. Yes. After, yeah, after the Cosby but show. Was, it, was that like her first role after Cosby? I think it was. I think it was. Aha. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and she was eight, becoming a big star now. Yeah, she was a big star already. She was yeah. already a big star. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, she was a big star. Well, she was new on the Cosby show. She was yeah. a, the newest member yeah. of the Cosby yeah. show as it was kind of starting to end. So, mm -hmm. you know, she's now, she was a household name then, but now she's doing more stuff and right. she's getting bigger. But what was, what was she like back then? She's incredible. Knew her lines, you know, was professional. She was, you know, a little professional. She knew my lines. She, she knew. <laughs> she knew my lines. No, Mark. That's yeah, not how it goes. Yeah, no, Mark. Stick to the script. Yeah, Uncle Mark. <laughs> Call me Uncle Mark. So yes, I, you know, she's incredible. Incredible actress. She's still going. Right. I mean, when you look at child stars, you know, a lot of them kind of, as they get older, they yeah. turn into train wrecks. Yeah. Not Raven Simone. Not Raven. Not Raven. Yeah, she's still an uh, empire. What do you think was your greatest story from the Mr. Cooper days? Wow. The greatest story from Mr. Cooper days, we got a couple of them. His greatest, his greatest stories from Mr. Cooper days. Woo! First, opening up for Richard Pryor. Probably the most incredible. He is my idol. You know, he's uh, somebody I always looked up to. He's the one reason I got into comedy. And it allowed me to open up for Richard Pryor to talk to him intimate. And he told me some things that I'll never tell anybody, but it was deep. And, and I got a chance to open up and talk to Richard Pryor. Not to me, but comedian, comedians can say that. They opened up for Richard Pryor. Right, I was because, opening act. Because 93! Because when, really, when you really take a step back, 
and you talk about the greatest stand-up comedians of all time, you'd be hard-pressed to say it's not Richard Pryor. It is Richard Pryor. It is. You know what I mean? It is. Who is better than Richard Pryor? It is. Stand he was up. the best. The White, best. black, Spanish, Asian, I don't care. I'm not going to put a, a race on Nobody. it. The greatest stand-up comedian of all time. Now, there's a, there's a there's quite a fight for number two. You know, you know, it made no difference. But Richard, no one's going to say they're better than Richard Pryor. Nobody. Nobody. Ever. And um, that was incredible. Two, um, I got a chance to play against Jordan. They did Space Jam on Warner Brothers lot. So every day I would work out in the morning. And, I, and Jordan, I mean, one thing about him, he really worked out that season he came back. I honestly saw him every morning work out at six. I would get to the gym and work out. Jordan be there before me. 5.30 a.m. every morning. And I know them dudes that stayed up late. I was like, cause, you know, I was like, man. But he was dedicated. And so, you know, he, you know, the ball came up and, you know, we didn't even say anything. You know, <laughs> he threw the ball to me. You know, I, I was talking my little shit. Yeah, we'll see. All right. You know, my first jumper, I made it. Oh, damn. I, I, you know, I thought you had that. And then he got the ball and he said, what you looking at? <laughs> I said, oh, man. And he skunked me from there. He said, what you looking at? He caught me looking at him. <laughs> and that's, that's an incredible story to me. So Mr. Cooper ran for five seasons. Yeah. Why did it ultimately end? Well, you know, I, I don't know. The ratings were good. You know, we took, they got a new president in, I think. Um, uh, they, they changed the the network president and she wanted to, you know, when they changed the network president, they want to bring their own show in mm -hmm. so they can get their points. Right. So they tried to kill our show. It put us at 930 at night, but we still survived. When we came out the first year, we were top, top 12. First, you know, I mean, we're black show. People don't build that. We made some history. And then they moved us to Friday at 930 after doing a top 10 share. But you couldn't kill us and we kept going. And we had a great time. So after five seasons, it finally ended. Yes. 100 episodes. Uh, how sad were you when you finally got that call to say, okay? No, I knew it was ending. Okay. I knew it was ending. And if you look at the ending, the last part of Mr. Cooper, I put on the squirrel suit. I was supposed to marry Holly. And I didn't want to get married and just be married and don't, the show done. So I said, no, I didn't want to get married. So I put on a squirrel suit. So at the end of Mr. Cooper, you see me with a squirrel suit on. <laughs> because I, I didn't want, I was crazy. But thank you, ABC, at the greatest run of our life. And we, I want to do it again. That's what yeah, I want. Bring yes, it back? I want. I just want to come back to TV. I want the Mark Curry show. Okay. I want to tell my story, baby. Okay. Well, you end up continuing to do a bunch of television. You were on the Jamie Foxx show. Yep. Played Sergeant Easy, mm -hmm. iconic character. You were on the Drew Carey show. Yeah. Uh, then awesome. you ended up on uh, Kirstie Alley's show. Yeah. Fat actress. That was great. They, they had me naked. I got naked. You got naked. Yeah, they had it. Yeah, nude scenes. I remember that. <laughs> yeah, that was crazy. I love that show because it wasn't a script. You could just say what you wanted. I never did anything like that. It was just, you just talk. <laughs> say anything you want. When I started talking, ask any question, it was like, wow. So I played Kirstie's Alley's love interest. Mm -hmm. Hilarious. So you're doing television and you're still doing stand-up the whole time. Yes. And which do you really love more? Is it the television or the stand-up? Well, you know, two different arts. I love them both dearly. They, uh, they go hand in hand. I believe that if your stand-up is really working properly and you're doing very well, then... It helps, it helps, you know, with, with your, you know, comedic timing on a television set, you know? So really? I love stand-up. Yeah. Yes. Well, I mean, people that, you know, like I'm friends with Godfrey and he'll... Yeah, Godfrey's awesome. I remember I asked him, how many uh, stand-up shows do you do in a month? And I think he told me like a hundred or something. Yeah. Like some yeah. some insane number, like Easily. multiple days a night, every night, yeah. like that's everywhere. That's what, what we do. Yeah. That's what we do. That's what we do. So then in, in 2005, there was a situation mm -hmm. uh, with a fire. There was a situation. Yeah. So lead, lead me up to that. Like, what exactly happened? Well, I'm beyond, that's kind of blocked out of my life, sir. And it's, you know, 
it's a, it's something. It was a bad situation, and it and it and it prompted me to go into a deep depression. And so I don't even deal with that. It was a bad situation, and um, and it took me. You know, it changed my life. Basically, you know, you know, the fire got on me. You know, I guess it was an aerosol can behind yeah, a water there. heater. Or something blew up. It was a fault, and bam, and it, thank you, Jesus. No, you know, I wasn't hurt. I, I was hurt very bad. Yeah, but I wasn't. You know, it wasn't scarred. Blew me back. I remember that thing blew me back. I never told people, but it blew me back. My shoulder was, I was burnt, but I think I broke my shoulder. And I was like, damn, my shoulder hurt. But I was so messed up on the other side. And fuck it. I didn't tell them about the sh <laughs> my, my shoulder. I think I had broke it. That's true. But anyway, it was a deep, bad situation that took me into a deep depression, you guys. I thought about suicide. I thought deep, but it's hard to commit suicide when you're 6'6 because of ceiling right here so you know you can't hang yourself yeah i can hang myself i can joke about that people say no it happened to me so you know and then um but it made me realize it made me change myself as a comedian it really did because it was like i was in there i was like man when i come out man i'm gonna be truthful i'm gonna be i'm gonna, I'm gonna hit them a completely different way no more holding back on this comedy well right because with the mr cooper show mm -hmm. you were like the straight lace guy yeah, yeah, I was straight. I was Mr. Cooper. You were Mr. Cooper. Yeah, I was Mr. Cooper. I was a teacher. Right. So I had morals. So you kind of formed your comedy around that character a bit. You didn't go yeah. all the way left with it. No, I, yeah. During that time, it was difficult because I was going. You know, I was a yeah. different comedian, and so here I go on stage, and people expect me to, you know, be a different guy, and I was a different comedian. So I, I was always funny, but it was like a hard transition, you know, for a minute, you know. It was, it was difficult. Well, I guess eighteen percent of your body got burned in that accident. Yeah, I got burned. Bam! I was in the St. Francis burn unit for I don't even know how long. I was in coma, self-induced coma, for a while, you know. And um, and the Lord saved me, and He saved me because I, you know, it was just a trauma event, and you know He saved me, and because I was supposed to get, you know. The pain, the the biggest thing that hurt me was I lost weight. I was like 230, 240 then, and it shocked my body or something, and suddenly I went that to zero. I went down to like a, I remember Nike sent me some clothes because I saw somebody else in the burn unit. I said, do I got to wear these scrubs? He said, no, you don't have to. I'm like, oh, man, send me a Nike outfit. So I'll be <laughs> Jordan in this month. I'm in the hospital, you know. And I remember they... They, I, I, I went to take a shower. They, they, they was, uh, she, the lady, the nurse would always take me to, I didn't take a shower. I, I was, couldn't put no water on me because I was bandaged, but I would just, you know, wash myself. I said, I'm putting on my Nike stuff. Nike opened my box. And I remember I put the pants on and the pants fell off. I'm like, what the hell? What happened? And the, they didn't give you no mirrors in there. I, I look. You know, like what? You know, these are my size, XXL. What the hell? Oh, there's no mirrors in the burn unit. Nah. Oh right, and then uh, and I, and then I I said, what is? I said, go get me a a, a scale. She said, you sure? I said, yeah, go get me a scale. What the hell? And I looked, and I lost. I lost so much weight. That's when I I caught crying. I was like, what is going on? What you know? And it you know it was a it was a bad situation to be in that burn unit, and they was gonna scrape you, and it was like. But I remember they wanted me to get into the water, and that's when the pain, you know. And I said, nah, they wanted to, they got a chair, they go dip you into the water. I said, nah, 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 nah. If I'm gonna take this pain, I'm gonna get in myself. Oh, sir, you can't do that. I said, bullshit. I said, ladies, back off. And I remember I took all my stuff off and I got into that water. It was supposed to hurt and it felt like a baptism. And the Lord, I didn't feel no pain. You know, maybe I don't know, but I didn't feel it. But the water felt good as hell. I was like, oh man, I didn't have no water for a while. And they did what they're supposed to do, the bad stuff. And, you know, and it was, it was, it was probably the most dramatic experience. It took me so low into a black, you know, valley. And people didn't know what was wrong with me, but it was like I was I went dark for some reason. Well, I guess Bill Cosby called you while yeah. you were in the hospital. Yeah, Cosby, Cosby called me. Yeah. Everybody called me. Yep. I'm in the hospital. Cosby called me, making jokes. <laughs> Damon Wayans called me. 
Chris Tucker, all the comedians called me. They all, guess, all the motherfuckers joked on me. Well, I guess they were comparing you to uh, to Richard Pryor. Yeah, they, every yeah. dude called me, and I took it in stride. Are you free basing too, motherfucker? Yeah, like, they, <laughs> all that shit. Yeah, that's what he said. He said, what, you smoking dope or something? I was like, no, man. And they all said, that's true shit. They all talk, yeah, they all talk shit to me. I mean, did you have a relationship with Cosby? Um, Yeah, I knew Cosby. Yeah, I knew Cosby. I mean, when you look at where Cosby is right now, I don't even talk about that. Yeah. No comment? Yeah, I ain't no comment on that. I, you know, I want to keep this interview. That's like in, uh, yeah, man. no offense. So eventually you get out of the hospital. Yeah. Now, are you still scarred up? Yep. Or yeah. Still scarred up, messed up, fucked up on some super pain pills. Still, to this day? No, no, no. Oh, when and you I refused get out. to take them. Like, yeah, they had me on some stuff so powerful. And I mean, my sisters knew what they were. Oh, I need one of them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Thank you, Tell them you just dropped it on the floor. Okay. No. <laughs> so, so you get out. Yeah. How long before you actually start doing comedy? To the you know, from the time you actually get released from the hospital. I I, I was back on that stage. I remember I had a, a corporate event to do in Mexico. Maybe about. I I remember I was in Mexico. I was still bandaged up, and. Um, so maybe, I don't know. I don't know how long it was, but I was still bandits up. I, I couldn't remember times. I remember I went to Mexico. I couldn't go outside because I still had fresh burns. But I still did that event. <laughs> Were you making like jokes about it during the, um, during the stand-up or did that come along? Well, I didn't tell. A lot of people didn't know about it. Since it happened in Oakland, you know, <laughs> right. we got TMZ. So <laughs> if it had been in L.A., it would have been all over. And I, the sub, I didn't want people to think that I was messed up. You know, you know people think you down. And I really didn't tell nobody, and people really didn't care, you know. You know, I don't think, you know. Okay. But you got right back on that stage. I got right back on that stage, a different animal, a different beast. So at this point, like, when I look at some of your more recent comedy, mm-hmm. it's a little more hard-edged. A little more, you know, swear words, a little more vulgarity, mm-hmm. uh, more sex jokes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you just start going all out at that point. Yeah, I start going all out. I start... Saying that I, I did it like this. I'm gonna say what I, what's on my mind, the truth. I'm not gonna hold back. I'm not gonna try to be conservative. Um, you know, they come to see Mr. Cooper. That was a TV show. I'm giving the people what they want. You know, people want to hear what they want to hear, and so I'm giving them. You know, I'm being me. You know, just being the different person. You got to change with the times. You know, you can't sit there and just do the same thing. And you know, I change with the times. Sometimes. I curse, sometimes I don't. I can do a c- complete clean set easily, but some of these times, you know, I'm cursing is in, within character. And so, you know, so, but it is what it is. When I was on that, that in that hospital, I said, I'm damn near dead. I don't, uh, you know, I'm hooked up to all these machines. I said, if I get out of this motherfucker, I don't care. I'm gonna go crazy. Well, you know, comedy started to change at one point yeah. because with the internet, the social media, comedians started to become mm-hmm. actual comedians, actual stand-up. You know, for example, I interviewed Ha Ha Davis mm-hmm. recently. Just, and, uh, you know, he did he went, a show with him. Yeah, went from doing skits mm-hmm. to getting on stage. Uh, Ryan Davis, another yeah. person I interviewed. Um, DC Young Fly. DC Young Fly, I've interviewed. On tour yep. with us. You know, what are your thoughts about, you know, now I'm kind of naming you three of the big standouts. Right. You know, who actually could do really... Carlos really Miller. well, yep. You know who really do good stand-up shows, but sometimes, you know, you're famous on the internet. That doesn't always translate to being good on stage because mm-hmm. it is with comedy. I feel it's a craft. Right. You can't go to college and come out a great comedian. Yeah. Like you know, I mean, you can't get a comedy degree. You have to actually do it year after year, decade after decade. Right. right. What are your thoughts about the new com- new well, comedians? I stay in my lane. Instead of criticizing these youngsters or you know trying to come up, if you just stay, my thing is I stay in my lane. I know what I need. I know when I step on stage, I have to be funny in my time allotted. I ain't got time to figure out what these guys gonna do if they're gonna stay. I kind of know what's gonna happen. You know, you look at them; they got famous from the internet, but you know it happened. You on stage, you know. I, I don't want to diss them. You know, I know them. You know, but, you know, a, a true comic will be there. It'll be there. When the dust settles, a true comic's going to be there. Yeah, I agree. What happened on the Southwest flight? 
I'm Southwest flight. I'm asleep. <sighs> flight attendant, whoa, whoa, he's happening. He's, he's beating somebody. I said, what? I thought, you know, she said, the man beating somebody up. I'm like, man, I don't want to die on a flight. Can you go help? I said, you know, I said, well, what's going down? I said, shit, you know, somebody trying to open up a window. We trying to die in here. If, I'm a, if we going to go down, then let's go down fighting. Food from the town. We ain't going to just take no terrorists, mother. What you got, homie? You got a box cut? We coming after your ass. So they woke me up, and it was some poor little black dude sitting back there with glasses on. And he had I don't know, hit, a, hit a lady or something, and I think they wanted me to go and see if he was all right. I said, I said player, you all right, man? You good? You good? They, you got these people scared back up here, man? You all right? You know? And he said, he was cool. And I said, man, you know, just, just chill out, man. Just relax. And then I said, well, you want me? I was going to give him my seat. He, they said, like, nah, let the motherfuckers stay where he was. Just, and I felt sorry for him because when he came, he landed. It was the FBI. And, right, because they had to do an emergency landing, right? Um, or they, they just went back to the airport again. All I know is I don't know what the, what happened. I think, yeah, we went back to the airport. Right. Because I, I didn't get home till like 2 a.m. Yeah. What happened to your uh, Ford Bronco? Man, all this news. My Ford Bronco. I had a 96 Ford Bronco. It was, it was my heart as a man. You know, I built it up from a puppy. She worked perfectly, and a tree fell on it. Crushed my Bronco. The whole I saw the picture. It's like yeah. a whole tree. A whole tree. Like right yeah. on the roof. The State Farm wanted to give me, like, you know, no money. Thanks, State Farm. <laughs> Well, it was being a, cheap. They were rude. They were. It was just. It was a weird situation. It was a '96. It was a '96 Ford Bronco. But try to find a Ford '96 Ford Bronco for four thousand dollars. <laughs> '96 Ford Bronco, baby. So, what are you working on these days? Um, right now, I'm on tour, um, uh, with Mike Epps and the Funny as Esh tour. Mm -hmm. Also with uh, some more and um, and. Um, I forgot the name of that tour name. Well, um, and I'm out there on these on this on this road. Um, what's next for me is I want to do a special. I don't know who who what is, what is on. I want to do a special, and I want to come back with a talk show and a sitcom. I think I could do both. I definitely want to come back with a sitcom. Just you know, I think I have fun doing sitcom. It was so much fun, and it would be a good time for me to come back. I think the world needs it. Yeah, man. Well, listen, I, I've seen some current, you know, some recent stand-ups you've done. and Where'd you see him at? Where'd you see this on, stuff? On YouTube. Oh, I gotta yeah. see that. You too. Yeah, yeah man. Okay. Listen, you, you have not you have not skipped a beat. I try. I try not to. You, you know you what? Still, you still it's working hard. That. It's being humble, doing the same things. I still go to the clubs. You gotta go to the clubs. You guys, you guys got all the things, you know, to stay in your lane. So you have the confidence when you step on stage. At least you know you're going to be funny. Don't worry about anybody else. What are you going to do? What's your brand? My brand is like Blue Magic. You don't know me and whether you know the CEO or not. But you know me. You know Mark Curry just like you know Coca-Cola. It's a brand name. Now, <laughs> if you were to name your top five stand-up comics of all time, no top fives. Richard Pryor. That's Richard it. Pryor, Richard Pryor, Richard Pryor. Richard Pryor, Richard Pryor, Richard Pryor. Richard Pryor five times in a row. Yeah, I can see why. Richard five times in a row. Because everybody I could name, you know, took a little bit of something from him, mm -hmm. you know. And so I say top five is is uh, Richard Pryor all the way. Yeah, man. Rest in peace. Yeah. Were you in contact with him after, I mean, later in life, after no. he went through the, the burn and everything else no, like that? No, Last time I saw him perform was at the comedy store. Every time I saw him, he went to the comedy store every time. So I would, I would be up there every night and watch him. Mm -hmm. I didn't think about filming it. I don't think we even had filming, you know. You'd have a mini DV camera back then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I didn't think about filming it. So that, that was my just watching him work. And he had got older. And that's it, you know. Yeah, man. Yeah. Major loss. Yeah, major, major loss. Rest in peace. But I'm not I'm not done. I look at it like this, especially seeing Tiger Woods. Especially I still have it in me. I'm never bitter. I'm not bitter. I just want to, you know, I want I want a show. I want a TV show. Whether it's a talk show, and I want to go on tour. That's a small ambitions. You know, maybe do a movie too. 
You know, Samuel Jackson started late. I haven't stopped. And I want it all. I want a movie. I want a TV show. I want a, a stand-up special. I want it all. Who's out there can give that to me? Come see me. Get at me. That's what it is, man. Mark Curry. Yes. Oakland's finest. The real Mark from Curry. From the town. That's town business, Our baby. Bay Area brother, man. Appreciate yes. you coming in. Thank you very much. Peace Til out. Till next time. Till Peace. next time.